We begin tonight with a visit to one of the St. Louis area's newest museums. Kara Vanninger shows us how a Marine Corps veteran, an old sword, and a PBS series were all vital to its creation. Jefferson Barracks is home to one of the finest military cemeteries in the country. Since its establishment in 1866, the expansive site has honored veterans with fastidiously maintained grounds and monuments. But the past 12 years have seen another kind of memorial taking shape here at the barracks. Just down the road from the cemetery, this old post exchange building had sat largely abandoned since 1946 after years of serving troops from both world wars as a gymnasium, barracks, and hospital. One day in 2002, Marine Corps veteran Mark Trout happened upon the old PX and his curiosity got the better of him. After learning of its history and long years of neglect, Mark felt compelled to save the building. But save it for what? The ultimate goal was an education facility or library with a sustainable future. Despite not yet having decided on the exact function of the building, Mark and his small crew of volunteers began restoration. As it turned out, the answer was sitting in Mark's basement all along. I can't explain how I started acquiring Civil War artifacts, but uh, a decade before I found this building, I was at my first auction and, and, and I seen an old sword. And I thought it was neat. It was only a couple hundred dollars back then. And I bought it and took it home and put it in my basement. And then over the next 10 years, I, I started acquiring. These acquisitions became the inspiration for turning the building into the Missouri Civil War Museum. A lot of people ask me, you know, I must be a big Civil War buff or a reenactor or a historian or a scholar, and, and I'm, I'm none of those. I, I love old buildings. I've renovated a few of them in my day. I always joke to people that my heroes in life are Abraham Lincoln and Bob Vila. I always knew my family had been involved in the Civil War. I was always fond of the story, but when Ken Burns' series went on the air for the first time, I watched it, taped it, and rewatched it. Without that series, this museum's not here because I would never have been interested in it. Once the building had an identity, it would face another challenge, funding. There is no federal taxpayer money in this. There is no, no state grants in this. This is a true grassroots operation. We'd have a, a, a fundraiser, a little trivia night or something, or we'd have a, a guest presentation speaker and raise a couple thousand dollars and go out and buy a couple thousand dollars worth of wood and just kept hammering, kept going. This building, is, my guess, uh, is probably about a $5 million restoration. But as far as actual cash outlay that we raised for it, it came in somewhere between 1.5, 1.7 million. Now to renovate a 16,000 square foot building that's been abandoned for 60 years, you can't do that. It doesn't work on the paper. The only way we were able to pull it off is it doesn't count for the tens of thousands of hours of myself and members of my staff and volunteers came in to do this. But it wasn't a large army that did it, it was a small group. Eleven years is a long time to be invested in a project with an unpredictable budget. But every time Mark questioned his choice to create the museum, his doubts were always answered with a resounding yes. That turning point for me was halfway through this project where you really didn't even know if it was going to make it. You know, chances are it was not going to make it. You're still in a boarded up, dilapidated building. And suddenly this gracious gentleman comes to me and, 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 and hands over his great-grandfather's medals of honor in his collection to me. You know, he didn't loan them to me. He gave them to me for this museum. And for a man like that to, to, to give you a gift like that where you, you, you can't put a, a price tag on something like that. And then through the years, the people who have given you family heirlooms, be it their great-grandfather's sword or their great-grandmother's dress, you know, there's an obligation now to take care of those forever. On June 29, 2013, after a tenacious decade of building, collecting, and believing, the museum finally opened its doors to the public. The exhibits are intentionally unbiased, letting the objects, photographs, and historical facts tell the story. We are neutral here, uh, neutral in the fact that it's, it's such a, a complicated story. It's the defining moment in our nation's history. Everything from the issues of states' rights to slavery and everything that comes along with that. Just the sheer destruction, you know, over, over 600,000 soldiers lose their lives. It's just not a white man's war. You know, the colored troops, 190,000 of them are fighting. Women, hundreds of them, documented cases of them sneaking into the Federal Army and fighting alongside their sons and their brothers and their fathers. The Native Americans, you know, the Chickasaw, the, the Cherokee, the Seminole, 
they're, they're involved in it. The whole generation of the time of the Civil War is caught up. This museum is set up entirely as a memorial of preservation to save their things and, and present and display their objects and try to ignite the passions and ignite the interests. That's the target to have children come in here and see enough here that it sparks their interest and they want to learn more. Not only in the American Civil War, but all the war eras of their nation's history. There's not a place in this building or on these grounds I can't look and there's not an Eagle Scout project. Several of those uh, who were just young scouts participating in a landscape project, next thing you know, they're you know, finishing museum studies uh, in their history degrees. And that was just on our regular construction you know, schedule. When I started this project years ago, my oldest daughter was nine years old. You know, she was one of the first persons I ever told about this building. Kristen Trout developed a passion for history as she grew up with the museum from nine years old into the day she left for Gettysburg College to pursue a degree in Civil War studies. Upon graduation, she moved back to St. Louis and now creates videos and soundtracks to accompany the exhibits. I was gone for four years, and so I miss a lot, and um, coming back here and being a part of it again is just it's, just, it's an amazing thing. We both encourage each other when, you know, things may seem really hard one moment. We, we're always there to kind of build each other back up and because we know each other so well. It's been an incredible experience for the two of us. So this proje project here of her being around this, uh, you know, has rubbed off to a point where she's the Civil War scholar in her family, not me. That, that's a perfect example of what I hope other children will do. Although the museum is open to all, Educating and inspiring young people is a priority. Field trips are carefully curated to meet curriculum needs, as well as to engage students through interactive lectures and tours of the barracks and cemetery. To the right of the vehicles, those are the old horse stables. Now, at one time, Jefferson Barracks was the cavalry capital of the nation. At one time, there were the restoration of the old post exchange building sparked a revitalization of the entire barracks including the building right next to the museum. We're under renovation right now. About 80% of the funds that the museum raises through uh, admission okay. fees, gift store purchases, memberships, and all, goes into these two buildings, primarily the building next door. Uh, our plans were hopefully to raise enough funding in the next 24 months to open that up as our educational facility for student field trips, presentations, and things like that, and also be the, the anchor for our, our, our manuscript and library collection. Susanna Krieghauser is a librarian assistant for the St. Louis Public Library and volunteers her time cataloging the boxes and boxes of books that have been donated to the museum over the past decade. You never know what you're going to get. It could be a pre-Civil War book from 1840. It could be post-Civil War. It could have somebody's um, personal notes inside. You just don't know. And, and just the sense of history that somebody from the Civil War might have touched this. So we need all those books and we need to preserve them. For the staff and volunteers at the Missouri Civil War Museum, education and preservation are not only acts of service to the community, but also ways to remember a defining moment in our country's not so distant past and to learn from it. I just want people to look at those artifacts and know that somebody has a story, this item has a story. Just understanding and having this appreciation for what we have here and for how, how we became America. The building next door I think is going to be a great resource for people who want to research a little bit more about maybe their own roots um, and kind of what they're a part of as Missourians. You know, some of these kids that come in here who are high school age, you know, they will be going into the military and they are seeing firsthand, you know, the legacy that will become theirs. They'll be part of that history as well one day. It's great to restore an old building. It's great to put a museum together and do something like this. But then you got to do some soul searching and you really got to, got to realize after all they've done for us, you know, not just Civil War, but all the warriors, and you really got to look and say, is this all they get? You know, is this all they get? It's got to be something greater on the horizon, and that's what we're going to strive for.